Hey, Amon and Christina, welcome to the She's Making an Impact podcast. I just want to tell you guys, I'm hey, kind Rachel, of, how are you? I'm so good. And I want to tell you, I'm kind of fangirling a little bit right now. <laughs> like we've had some cool guests on the show, like Emmy award winners and like some real rock stars. I think I'm most excited to have you guys on out of like everybody almost. Oh, no way. <laughs> so, I am so serious. I've been following you guys for about a year, like obsessed with your YouTube channel. I went through your course, like devoured it literally oh, in a weekend, you. implemented everything have a plan for our family to achieve fire in the next like eight years so i'm just like so excited and it's an oh, honor to have you guys here so thank you for being here oh thank you for that <laughs> we're super excited to do it it's so exciting to talk to you so we're so glad that it all worked out yes so why don't we start off just tell us a little bit about yourselves and your journey to getting to where you are right now yeah, so uh, I'll start with the end, which is where we're at right now. We're in Lisbon, Portugal, and this was after several years of really pursuing FIRE, which is financial independence and retiring early. We were federal government employees. We're from the San Francisco Bay Area, but we also worked in Japan. And during that time, we were really working on tightening up our finances, trying to find ways to make extra money. We were cutting places in our budget to save money, and then we were investing along the way. And during that time, over an eight year period, we reached financial independence, which is basically this concept that you have enough money in your portfolio that you could quit and you'd never have to work again and you live off of your portfolio. So that happened when we were working as federal government employees in Japan. So we ended up quitting our jobs and we retired here in Lisbon, Portugal. Which is amazing. And you guys retired at 40, yeah? Yeah, it's a weird one. So Amon's 39. Or I'm sorry, when we retired, Amon was 39 and I was 41. So we sort of split the difference and we're like 40, but Average. technically 39 and 41. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So FIRE stands for financial independence, retire early. How did you learn about this movement? Well, you know, it, it, it recently became popular. I think for, for a long time, most people just considered it living off of your passive income or you know, living off of your investments. But recently, this movement has really gained steam. And when we first started it, most people weren't calling it FIRE. They were just really just living off of their investments. And so when we had this idea to retire early, uh, we initially focused on investing in real estate and generating enough passive income from real estate in order to sustain ourselves in retirement. Um, but as we went down this investment whole we started discovering other ways to invest money um, and how to live off of those investments and uh you know eight years ago like christina said we we started this journey and throughout those eight years our journey has really evolved we've tightened things up and we've really learned the mechanics of living off of your investments and so i would say you know our journey started eight years ago but it's always evolving even till this day our journey is still you know, a work in progress. So eight years ago, did you have mentors or people that were doing kind of like what you're doing now that you would look to for advice? Or was it kind of like, we're just going to figure it out? Eight years ago, it was really about us figuring it out. I mean, we didn't come from families with money. Our parents weren't investors. We didn't, neither one of us talked about money growing up in our family. So it wasn't like we came with this whole tool set once we graduated from college and was like, okay, we're going to invest in this. We're going to invest in this. This is how you make extra money. Let's save money here. That wasn't what we had when we came out of college. And so we didn't have the mentors in terms of people showing us how to invest or what to do with our money. I mean, our parents are, were definitely influential in our lives in other, in other ways, but we weren't learning our money background from them. And so for us, it was really about really figuring out financial literacy, how to invest, what are bad investments, because good investments are, are great, but if you're also making those bad investments, then that can really chip away on your FIRE journey or just allow you to fail on your fire journey. So for us, it was just all about becoming educated and really learning everything ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, once we, once we learned all the theory, we learned as much as we could, we just jumped right in. So our story is also about taking action. And I remember, you know, the first time we had taken action on our first real estate deal and it worked and we were just like so inspired by that. 
And so, I mean, a lot of people will do all of the reading, they'll take all the courses, but they neglect to take that next step. And so mm-hmm. for us, that was a really big piece of our journey. I love that you say that because one of the things that I always tell my students is to take massive action and just like move and it's okay. You might make a mistake or you might mess up, but it's better than just staying where you are. Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's everything we talk about too. It's like you know, the most important thing is if you have this wealth of knowledge, it's not useful unless you're putting it to use. And so you have to take action so you can move forward and so you can achieve your goals. So that's the same thing that we talk about too, is really believing in yourself and taking that action. Cool. So what's a fire number and how do you calculate that? That's a good question. So a fire number is, the. let's start with the way you calculate it. Or no, let's start with what it is. <laughs> so your fire number is basically the amount of money that you would need in a portfolio in order to be financially independent. So meaning that you never have to work again. So that's the number you'd have to have, the amount of money you'd need basically in your stock portfolio. So the way you calculate it is first you have to budget. So when you create a budget, you sort of get a sense of where all your money is going and how much you're spending. And so the fire number is not based off of how much you're spending currently, but how much you're going to be spending in retirement. So the way you calculate your fire number is you look at, you estimate your amount of expenses in retirement, and you look at that on a yearly, on a yearly basis. So whatever your your amount of expenses is for a year in retirement, you take that and you multiply that by 25. And whatever that number is, that is your fire number. And the concept is that once you get to that fire number, then you can pull 4% from your stock portfolio and you can live on that and you continuously live on that without your principal balance in your stock portfolio dipping down. And so you could do that for the rest of your life. Okay, so you take 4% out, would it ever like decline or would that number just stay where it is and then you have something to actually pass off to your kids when you pass away? Yeah. I mean, the idea is that you ha- it will last you for a lifetime. And so when you pass away, you can pass that portfolio down to your children. It's almost like generational wealth. And the concept behind that comes from, I mean, it's explained really well in the study called the Trinity study, where they look at different portfolios and they look at different withdrawal rates, whether you withdraw at a 4% rate, 5%, 3%, and they look at how you can withdraw from a portfolio and still have money at the end of your lifetime. This study was for a 30 year period, but it's the idea is that it can be extended beyond that. And so the 4% rule is really this safe, considered the safe withdrawal rate. And the reason really is because the, the stock market fluctuates. It goes up and down. And I mean, we've seen more than 20% returns in our stock market, in our stock portfolio. And then we've also seen dips. And so the idea is that it doesn't stay stagnant all the time, but over the past 100 years, the stock market has returned an average of eight to 10%. And so the idea is if you're pulling 4%, your portfolio is still growing and it's keeping up with inflation. And so when you're pulling out that 4%, you're not actually touching your principal balance in your portfolio. Got it. So question, when you're calculating the fire number, do you calculate it of like, I need $4,000 a month now to live or 30 years from now with inflation, it would be like what, $6,000 or something like that. Which number would you go with? Well, the 4% rule takes into account inflation. So what you do is you can calculate your number. I mean, it's not your now number though, because once you retire, your numbers can change, you know, like your healthcare, you'd have a different cost with your healthcare. Maybe your housing is a different cost or something like that. So you predict what they would be in retirement based off of those changed numbers. But when you're drawing that 4%, it already takes into account inflation. Got it. Okay. So you guys were both government employees. So you weren't making like a ton of money with your job. So it wasn't like you were millionaires when you started. Did you just have like a moment where you're like, screw this. I want to retire, quit my job. Like what was that turning point for you where you decided I'm done with this? I want to retire, live free. Well, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm credited with that moment because (laughs) I was at, I was at work one day and I mean, looking back on it, I, I can't believe that Christina was actually uh, on board with the idea. <laughs> so I was, at, I was at work one day and um, I was getting an award for my years in service with the federal government. I, I had been there for 10 years. Um, and there's this, there's this ceremony where they give everyone awards at the same time based off of um, the amount of service you have. And so I was in line and so were a bunch of other folks. 
And they marched me up on stage. They gave me a, my award for 10 years and they marched me right off of stage and no one made a big deal about it. Mm. And at that same ceremony, there was someone that got an award for 30 years of service. And, you know, I, I, I remember leaving feeling very insignificant and going home and telling Christina, you know, I just can't, I can't see myself giving up another 20 or 30 years of my life to only really get a piece of paper. And there was so much more that I wanted to, to do with my life. And so when I went home and told Christina this idea, she was so supportive. And, and that's what's really great about our relationship is that we bring home crazy ideas all the time, right? And we just figure out a way to get to yes. And so it was at that moment that we really start to get intentional about our lifestyle. Because we had, you know, up to that point, we were saving and investing the average amount of money um, that most people are advised to save. 10 to 15% of their income should go into their retirement accounts. But for us and anyone that's pursuing FIRE, that is a very low bar. People can do more and they should do more. And just, you know, we always say that everyone should, sh should, should try to pursue this endeavor. Just by pursuing it, you're gonna be off, you know, you're gonna be in a better place. If you can get up to 20% or 30% or 40% of your income, we were able to push our savings rate up to 70% of our income because we had this fire number in mind, which was a big number, but we were able to break it up into little pieces and just get 1% better to get to 70%. Would you share what the fire number was for you guys? Yeah, for us, it was a little, it was a little over $2 million, <laughs> but I, and I, I'll caveat this to say that we're living, like I said, we live in Lisbon, Portugal, but we're from the San Francisco Bay Area. So for us, we calculated our number based off of retiring in the Bay Area. And we also have two young, young girls. Mm -hmm. And so our concept behind really figuring out what number we were going to use was that we decided to use the highest number of where we wanted to ultimately, or where we could potentially retire, which yeah. is returning home, because we didn't want to end up somewhere here, for example, in Lisbon, and then two, three, five years later decide, you know what, we really miss the Bay Area, we need to return to the Bay Area, or if our girls decide they want to go to school in the States and we want to follow them, or whatever whatever the scenario could be, we wanted to be able to return to the States and to the Bay Area if we needed to. So we calculated our number based off of living in the Bay Area. So it was a, it was a bigger number than if we just calculated it living off of here. Yeah. And like Aman said, we went over and we explained how the fire number works and how you calculate it. And if your listeners go out and calculate their fire number, they may just fall out of their chair. Like, how is this possible to do something, you know, so large? Because if it's not millions of dollars, it can be a smaller amount of dollars, but it's based off of your own living circumstances. So if you're multiplying that by 25, whatever it is, it's going to be a big number to you. And so for us, like Aman said, our focus was just on piecing it up. Don't look at the biggest number. I mean, that's your ultimate goal. But if you break it up into steps and just work on chipping away at those steps, it becomes a lot more doable and a lot more manageable when you're doing steps versus I need to get to $2 million. Yeah. So and and I want to... Go ahead. I want to say something about the, the, the fire number. You know, for us, we had actually identified several, several fire numbers based off of different, different locations. And as we, were on this, as we were on this journey, we'd often have a, a really hard day at work. And we would say, boy, we should just retire in Thailand. Or, you know, we've hit our number for Portugal. Let's just leave right now and go to, and go to Portugal. But it was really nice to have, you know, this big goal and just... As we got closer to it, we were just so inspired. The momentum really starts to really starts to go with you when you're on this journey. Um, so that you know, that's that's something that I always tell people. Uh, it's a big number, but like Christina said, when you break it up, it's really digestible. How do you break it up into okay? I have two million dollars as my number to how much I need to actually invest every month. Well, I think the the concept is you know. The sooner that you can invest and the more that you can invest each month, it works better for you. So the idea is that once you're investing earlier, you're getting the benefit of compound interest. So if you're investing a larger amount earlier, 
it's going to have a bigger impact than if you break it out evenly over your whole period. So there's not really, a, I mean, the idea really is you've, you've got to do more than the standard amount of savings. You know, we were out there making more money. We were out there saving more money. And for us, it was 70%. And that's what we were just really hustling and trying to save as much as we could. And then we also had real estate. And so when we sold all of our real estate, we got a big chunk of profit from that that we threw into the stock market also. So there's not re one real rule of thumb in terms of you need to save this much. But the concept is, of course, the more you can save, the more you can make, then the more you can invest early on and then compound interest will start to do its work. And then you'll see your portfolio growing more and more. But you can you can um, kind of estimate when you'll when you'll get there. And we we often talk to a lot of people that say I'm three years out from my fire number or I'm, I'm five years out from my fire number. And that's because they have plugged in the amount of money that they're able to save per month or per Per, per year, and they apply the average return of the, the stock market. And then they can kind of predict how much their portfolio will be out into the future. And most people that are uh, planning for retirement now, they're saving, like I said, 10 to 15%. And at that rate, if you, if you, if you consistently invest in the stock market, you're, you'll retire in, in 30 or 40 years. But imagine if you could save more, you move that number up even sooner. And so people that are pursuing fire, if they can get to a savings rate that is above 50%, they move that timeline up way earlier. Yep. So what are some of the side hustles that you did to increase your income so you could invest more? Oh, we were, we were side hustling our butts <laughs> off. So, so, you know, we are, we're kind of like those serial side hustlers. Maybe we, maybe we should have focused on one and just stuck with it. But we, you know, we also have fun doing these types of things. So some of the side hustles we did is we did kind of retail arbitrage uh, with, with things we bought at Ikea in the as is section. I don't know if you've ever been to Ikea, but they have this section in Ikea where they mark down items significantly. Really? And so, oh yes, tr tremendously. But one of the, the niches that we discovered was that they were marking down kitchens and bathroom you know, materials, so like countertops, sinks, all of these different things. And we'd walk in there and see like granite countertops that were 90% off, you know, butcher block tables that were selling for, for $10, right? I mean, entire countertops. And so it was like people were just walking past money every single day. So we, we went in there, we loaded up our, our car once a week, and then we would resell those items on, on Craigslist, on Facebook Marketplace, all these different things. I mean, we did a number of things like that, but our idea was that we would see money in the streets and we, it was just there for us to pick it up with every side hustle. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you another example. So we, we would drive around and we'd go to get these free pallets, you know, like at the grocery stores where they have the pallets where they bring all the different groceries on it and they drop off stuff at the grocery store and then the pallets just sit there. We got those for free. We were in Oakland. And once. then we would flip those pallets. Yes. Right? So we would make furniture out of them. So we get them for free. We make furniture out of them. And then we would rent different tools at the tool lending library in Oakland. And so we would make furniture with the free tools, with the free pallets and turn around and flip those. We one time went I wouldn't call it dumpster diving, but one time we went and we were driving out and we saw this dumpster with, it was full, full of like tons and tons of really nice wine boxes, wine crates. Yes, from like France and Portugal, and this it, was in the US. Yes, and it was right behind a, like a liquor store. And so we went to the liquor store and we're like, are you getting rid of these? I mean, like they're in the garbage. Are you throwing them out? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, and we said, do you mind if we take these? So we took all of these wine crates and we just sold them and people were like coming and buying them in like the car load you know and it was just the idea that we saw them we had the insight to say i think we can make money from this and so we did that i mean there was one point when when uber was first established and we're from the bay area and uber it was created in san francisco and so when they first started really trying to develop their company. Lyft was also developing their brand as well. And so there was sort of like this competition between Lyft and Uber at the time to get drivers and to really pick, like really take over the, the, the market in terms of what Uber and Lyft had. And so at the time they were offering 
drivers. I don't even remember it what was, the amount this, of this money was. This was like the, this was the hack that we would tell people about this all the time. So they were offering drivers $45 an hour just to turn the app on. This was before anybody had, had ever heard of Uber. So when we would tell people, you need to sign up for Uber because if you just turn on the app, they pay you $45 an hour. And we had lived like kind of in this, in the hills, in like the hills of Oakland. So the, the, the app was never used up there. So we would turn on our app and we would get paid $45 an hour and never have to give anyone a ride. It was, it was amazing. And we did that. And I think we made like over $20,000 just with that app. And we tell people it, no one would listen. And now everyone is driving for Uber. And unfortunately they're not making anything driving for Uber. So it, you know, th there were a lot of things like that. And some people will say, oh, you guys were lucky, right? But we were just open to, to, to opportunities and ready to take action. I literally just did a little training for, I coach entrepreneurs and I was talking about, do you know, are you familiar with the reticular activating system? It's like no. the part of your brain. So like, let's mm -hmm. say I'm going shopping for a Hyundai Elantra. When I start shopping for the Hyundai Elantra, all of a sudden I start to see them everywhere. It's like my brain is open to seeing that. So it's like your guys' brains were just open to like, how can I make more money? And you would just see these opportunities everywhere to be like, I can make money doing that. So I yeah, exactly. love that. You guys literally just gave me an idea though, because we live in a suburb where people just put their like trash out on the curb and they post in the Facebook group like free. I'm like, when my husband gets back from Senegal, that's going to like, I'm going to have this be his job where he just takes yes. all the free stuff and sell it. Um, exactly. <laughs> He'll just be driving around the neighborhood, right? <laughs> and just dumping stuff in his car, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. So where would you resell that stuff? Like Facebook marketplace or eBay or what would you do? We didn't do eBay, but we did like Facebook marketplace. We did Craigslist. Those were, they would just get picked up immediately ones. from that. Yeah. Okay. I love this. Okay. Um, how did you live rent and mortgage free? Oh, I love talking about that. So, uh, so I mentioned we lived in Japan. So there were quite a few ways that we lived rent and, and mortgage free, but I think one that's probably most applicable to, to everyone because there were different stages when we did that. One was like pre-kids, we lived rent and mortgage free, but the one that I liked the most was actually working abroad. So when we worked abroad for the federal government, we lived in Japan. And then at another time, we also lived in Spain. And by working abroad for the federal government, at, at we both worked for a Navy base. And so by doing that, we ended up getting all of our housing and all of our utilities paid. And it was it it was a nice house. Too. I mean, they were not really nice homes. And we got to pick the home. It wasn't, we weren't living on base. We had all of the homes that we could choose from. And I think for us, not only was it something about, you know, just getting free housing and utilities, but it was such an incredible opportunity to live abroad and to have our kids experience different cultures. And so that was by far the best way that we were able to live rent and mortgage free because we got so much more out of it than just getting free housing. For sure. So talk to us about the real estate deal that you did, like the first one. How did you, like, what did that look like? Wow. So, you know, we had done a, a couple of real estate deals in, in the Bay Area. And one of the things that I, that I like to focus on is that we, we weren't like real estate moguls. You know, we were just, we, we only really sold three properties, but we were very smart about having a plan in place before we just jumped right into real estate. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we um, used an FHA loan in order to buy our primary residence in the San Francisco Bay area. And it was really hard to find a home in the San Francisco Bay area when we were looking, but we had this tactic where we would look during the off season. We bought all of our houses like over Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's when no one was bothering to look for houses. And so when we got our first house, it was, it was kind of a superficial fixer upper, but it, it was something that we knew that we could do based off of just watching YouTube and all these different, you know, different resources that are available to, to people for free. And we bought this house. We ended up doing what's called a live and flip where you can live in your primary residence and, and, we, and we fixed it up at the same time. It increased our equity. And then we were able to use that equity to buy two other properties. And that, that was the seed that we planted and it was it was a $20,000 down payment on that first house and from that $20,000 
down payment, we were able to really create $400,000 worth of profit from, the, from, 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 from our entire portfolio once we sold everything. And it was, it was an amazing thing that people were telling us at the time the prices were too expensive in the Bay Area. Don't bother. You should move out to the suburbs. You should, you know, you should, you should go somewhere else. But we had a plan. We knew that if we put this plan into action, that it would result in returns like this. Oh, turning twenty thousand dollars into four hundred thousand dollars is pretty <laughs> awesome. Oh my gosh. So it sounds like you guys have you've had a lot of things just like go your way or under control. Did you have any challenges or like really struggles while you were on this fire journey? I mean, I think the biggest challenge is really that mind shift, right? You know, because along this, this journey, the idea is that I think Americans, and, and we wouldn't exclude ourselves from that. We are taught to have this sort of consumer relationship. I mean, it's like this idea that materialism or, or certain items equate to your status or, or they define who you are. And I think that's just sort of common in American culture to feel that way and to feel that if you get these brand name items, these luxury items, then that will somehow represent who you are as a person. Yeah. And, and for for us and for anyone that's pursuing fire, you really have to let that go because it is not, it, it's sort of this external thing that, that you're concerned about what other people think about who you are. And if you stop buying luxury items or, or spending your money on these things, it doesn't change who you are as a person, but it does change your ability to actually pursue fire and reach fire. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges for people, you know, for people to really, really think about what matters to them, how they want to be reflected in life and and what is important to them. Yeah. And by doing that and really going through that analysis, it, it can be challenging when people see, for example, we were driving an $800 car. We could have very easily had a very expensive car and we did initially, we had a brand new BMW SUV and we got rid of it and we started driving an $800 car. And it was really because you do that mental work and you think, you know, I. I spent all this money on this car. Like what, what is it doing for me? I, I can, we ended up buying an $800 car and it served the same purpose. Okay. And so I think for anyone who's really interested in pursuing fire, the challenge is more mental is really thinking about what you need to do in order to get somewhere. And don't think of it like you're giving something up, but mm -hmm. think about it as if you're going towards something. You're going to be gaining something in the future if you change your lifestyle and you focus on things like saving and making money and really focus on investing. Yeah, I like to call it, you know, short-term sacrifice for long-term gain. And it, you know, it's, it's going to take a shift in your life. People, people that are on this journey there's some things that they're just going to have to give up. Um, but I want to go back to the point where you, you, you know, you asked about challenges and Christina and I are optimists. Our children are also very optimistic and we've certainly had challenges in our life, in our entire life, you know, and over this eight year period, it, it just hasn't been like things have just fallen into place. <laughs> right. I wish we were that lucky. We, we'd be contrillionaires right now, but <laughs> The, you know, every challenge that we encountered, we just rallied together and got over it. I mean, there were things that happened throughout these eight years that most people would hang their heads down and say, I can't do this. I have to give up. Mm -hmm. You know, Christina was in law school for a good portion of this, uh, of this period. And we had two small children. And when she would go to law school, people would say to Christina, oh my goodness, how are you able to be in law school and you have two young children. And Christina never had a second thought about it. She was like, because this is my life, right? Mm -hmm. Like people, you know, it's all relative sometimes, how hard your life is and, the ch and how you deal with those challenges. And maybe, maybe, maybe what some people would perceive as challenges, we perceived as, you know, opportunities, things to strengthen us so that we could figure out a way to get, get around this and then come out of it even stronger. 
I love that. And I think what you said, Christina, like a lot of times we spend money on things that we think are going to make us happy and it might make us happy for like a second, you know, and then it's like back to back to normal. So like example, we live in probably the nicest house we've ever lived in right now. Like I have a big closet. Am I any happier now than when I was living in West Africa where I didn't have a bathroom? It was a hole in the ground that we shared with the entire floor and doing bucket baths. Like, am I any, like, seriously, am I really happier? Not really. Like, it's nice to have a shower and air conditioning, but like on terms of like one to 10 happiness level, I was happy there. Like I had some awesome people that I was surrounding myself with, you know, like having a big house and like all the things doesn't really bring joy and happiness, you know? Yeah. I love that. I love that you use that example, you know, because it's really like happiness is really in your core. You know, it's not, it's not what you, it's not the things that you have. It's really your relationships. It's people, it's who you love. It's that you're loved. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's not impacted by any type of material, you know, like if, if, if I bought a brand new $5 million house, I, Amon wouldn't love me anymore. The girls wouldn't love me anymore. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's really, I wouldn't love me anymore. It's all really internal, how, how you feel about yourself and, and what brings you happiness. So I love that example that you have, you know, it's just thinking about there could be times where you had like nothing and you look back and you're like, that was a really, I really loved that time, you know? And so I think if people can tap back into that, you know, where, where they didn't have a lot and, and still found that happiness, then they can start really retraining their brain to think about what brings them joy and how they actually can derive joy from what they do every day in life. Definitely. What are some of the habits that you guys have that have helped you become millionaires and also some of the mindset practices, because you guys do think differently than a lot of people. So what are some like the habits or mindset practices that you guys have? I would say, uh, wow, there's so many. Aman <laughs> said for sure. Aman said definitely, he, fo- he talked about positivity. And mm-hmm. I think that is so, so important when you are pursuing fire, being positive. And it doesn't mean that you're, gonna ha- you're not going to have any bad days, like nothing's going to be rough and, and you, can't, you can't be upset about something. But ultimately, your positivity has to outweigh that that feeling of, oh my gosh, I'm stuck, or what do I do? You know, so it, it's about being positive because, like we said, also when you look at your fire number, you could just fall out of your chair and yeah. think, like, oh, there's no way to do it. So you start off with that, with that positivity. Yeah. And, you know, we have a lot of um, mechanical habits that we have in place, just things that we do on a very r- routine basis. And when we were on this journey, one of the things that we had to set in place was a plan and then consistently follow that plan. So I, I love putting things on, on autopilot. So one of the things is when we set up our budget, the first thing we did was we prioritized investing and we paid ourselves first in our budget. And then from that point on, that determined our discretionary spending. And we considered housing, our automobiles, all of these other things, discretionary spending after we prioritize investing. And so it's, it's things like that, that in order to achieve wealth, in order to, you know, accomplish your goals, you have to be able to consistently do something for a very long period of time. And if you're able to do that, you will be successful at anything. And I tell my daughters this all the time with their sports, with their schoolwork, it's about being consistent, about moving up at every level. So if you, you know, if there's one habit that we just really try to embody, it's just being consistent. And I would say, and we've already talked about this one too, is action, right? It's about having the confidence in yourself to say, I'm going to take this step and I'm going to take action. It may not turn out exactly how you want it to turn out, or it may turn out even better. You know, there are, there are different ways that the scenario can go, but you never know unless you take action. So I think that is definitely one thing that Aman and I had was like, okay, we have an idea. We're not going to sit on it for three years. We are going to do this and we're going to take action now. So I think that's really important for people when they're on the fire journey is really taking those steps and taking action. I love that. So, all right, we're committed. We're going all in. We're going to take massive action. We're going to be consistent. First step, set up an account with Vanguard. Is that what you would recommend? 
Well, I think, you know, we have, we actually have several different accounts. It's not, it's not just with Vanguard and Vanguard is our primary account, but we wouldn't tell people it has to be with Vanguard, for example, but there are low cost brokerage firms. And so the idea is really know what those firms are. Like Vanguard is one, Schwab is one, Fidelity is another one. They're very, they're user friendly. They have great customer service. The most important thing is that they're low cost. They have very low fees associated with the investments that we make. And so when you're making investments, that's something you definitely have to keep in mind. You have to keep in mind the fees because the those fees can really chip away at your return. And if you're getting impacted with fee after fee after fee, or you're taking an expense ratio that's way too high on your investment, then your return is much smaller than what you would get if you go with a low-cost brokerage firm like Vanguard or Schwab or Fidelity. Okay, yeah, but so- I, 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 I think, you know, to go to, to go to Christina's point, this having knowledge of the fees goes back to really where you should start. It's developing that knowledge, right? Getting, the, getting, a, getting, a, getting a foundation in money by reading just a couple of investment books, a couple of strong investment books. And by having that what knowledge- What are your favorites? It, oh my way. goodness. So uh, <laughs> the, Bogle, the Boglehead's Guide to Investing. Okay. That's by far our favorite book. It is, it is one of those books that doesn't talk about getting rich quick. It gives you the fundamentals. And then after reading a book like that, you're able to really evaluate how you should start looking at investments. And for anyone that is going to start investing for financial independence, they really have to learn how to leverage all of the accounts that they have available to them from a tax perspective. Mm -hmm. And we, we talk about, we first started investing in our, in our tax advantage accounts before we were able to start investing in our taxable accounts. So there's, there's, a, there's a strategy to this. You have to, you have, to have a plan and I think everyone needs to invest with a plan. Mm -hmm. One of, you know, we get this question all the time, where should I start? And people come with us with, with very specific questions. And so we created two resources for people. One was putting together a fire plan. We have this fire workbook that we want people to like go through this workbook. By going through this workbook, you will really get a, an assessment of yourself, where your money is going, and you can put together that fire plan. And then the other thing is for people that like, you know, the people that want to pursue financial independence by investing in the stock market, we have this stock market investing course. And we spend a lot of time in this course getting people's mind right before we just jump right into buying your first investment. Because the problem, and, and, and it goes back to being consistent, is if the stock market drops tomorrow, if you don't understand the history of the stock market, how it works, the first drop is going to scare you and you're going to sell, you're going to lose your money and you're never going to want to invest again. So a successful investor, anyone that's going to be successful on this journey needs to start with the foundation first before they jump right in. And I just want to give you guys a plug for your course because it's so good. And like everyone listening needs to go and get it. It's super affordable too. Like we need to talk about raising your prices. because it's <laughs> <laughs> I was like, really? That's it? Like, and oh my gosh, like it's yeah, so good. So definitely get the course. And we're talking about some like technical things that newer people might not understand. So like taking notes on things like expense ratio. Um, you guys cover that in the course, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. okay. Yeah. So I mean, it, we cover all the different types of fees that can be associated with your with your investment. So an expense ratio is just the same. You know, it's this percentage that they that they take from your investment. That you know, if you get a, a hundred percent, you know, whatever your hundred percent return is, they're taking off whatever that expense ratio is right off the top. And so if you're looking at something that has a three percent expense ratio, then it's like, oh my gosh, you're on the floor. That's just like you're, they're taking all your money it's too much. Because 3% may sound like, oh, that's not that much. But if you start calculating it, and like we were talking about that compound interest and how that works, and the, the concept that you're supposed to be pouring, pulling 4% for retirement, if someone's taking 3%, that is definitely a no-no, you know? It's so it's understanding those fees and, and expense ratio isn't the only one. There's all these other fees that they can tack on to, to your investments. And so being aware of how, what your fees are, how they're impacting your return, it's, it's very important in terms of the growth of your portfolio. 
For sure. That, I think that's something people don't necessarily think about is fees and then taxes. So what are the tax implications of FIRE and how do you work on your tax efficiency? Yeah, well, for tax efficiency, the, the idea is really you want to invest in your tax advantaged accounts first. I mean, that is really helping your money so that you're not getting money. It's, it's almost like if you think about taxes, almost like an expense ratio or another fee, right? It's like they'll take away what your actual amount of money is. But if you can safeguard it, if you can put it in these tax advantaged accounts, then you're able to keep more money in your investment and allow it to grow more. And then you're also thinking about what types of investments should I put in a tax advantage account or what type of investments should I put in a regular brokerage account? So I think definitely in terms of really growing your portfolio, you, you do have to think about the taxes and almost think of it like a fee because it's sort of, it can drain your portfolio as well if you're not, if you're not investing with taxes in mind. Definitely. What are some of the tax implications of you guys living abroad and living in Portugal? Well, I will tell you that anyone that is a U.S. citizen and they live abroad and they have a portfolio in the States, you are required to pay taxes on that. So it really depends on, you know, where you are in, in the world in terms of how your taxes work in the foreign country that you go to, but you will not be able to avoid taxes in the States. It's just a given, you know, and so that's really a, another thing is understanding how you're going to be pulling from your accounts and how it's going to be taxed. Those are all important parts of the FIRE journey because it's not just about saving and making money and then investing it, but it's also understanding how it's supposed to grow. Where are your accounts going to be held? How do you access your accounts? Got it. Why did you guys decide Portugal to retire? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Portugal has just been you know, coming into our life time and time again. And it, it has just spoken to us so many, so many <laughs> times. So when we first lived abroad, um, we lived in Spain and we'd come over to Portugal for vacation. And I think that's when we fell in love with it. It was in the Algarve and, you know, Spain is wonderful. We, we you know, Spain was actually on our list to retire, uh, but Portugal just beat it out. It was just, it, it was just so many, just really cool things about Portugal. The people are so welcoming. Uh, they, you know, they're patient with you. Uh, the transition here, as far as the visa process and just assimilating, they make that so easy for expats. Uh, we didn't have to translate our, our documentation into Portuguese like we'd have to do in some of the other countries. Yeah. So we really understood how to get from A to Z as far as, as far as moving here. And then once we, you know, just being here, everything's amazing. Now we had, we had come to Portugal, I think, four or five times before we decided on Portugal and we had done a lot of research. And now that we've lived here a year, we are, it was the best decision we've, we, we've ever made because it's better than we expected. I mean, there, there are so many benefits to being in this country. I love that. So my husband, we actually lived in France for two years. And if we wanted to stay there long term, I'd have to set up my business as like an auto entrepreneur and then pay French taxes, which are mm -hmm insanity it's like 60 percent in the highest bracket you know oh my so gosh. what are the taxes like in portugal for expats and entrepreneurs well, well we're here on a d7 visa so we have this tax advantage break and i think doesn't france probably has like a dual treaty with the united states too i'm assuming where you're not having to be taxed in both countries so that's what portugal has you're not going to be taxed in portugal and in the united states on the same money i don't know if, Port if france has that but i think you know for us the because of that also was another reason why we're like okay portugal is really looking good in terms of you know the people and taxes in general too because we knew we wouldn't have that double tax situation but i do think a lot of other countries in uh in europe have something similar perhaps it was like if wherever you stay the longest is where you would pay so if we stayed six months in a day like in france and we'd be paying in france so it was i like, see that's where we're like right we're leaving <laughs> i love yeah. it here but <laughs> yeah i mean portugal, 
Portugal has, they have like tax incentives for people to come to Portugal. Really? They also have this thing called the golden visa, which is sort of being revamped a little bit, or it was pre COVID where people could buy real estate in Portugal. And just by the very nature of doing that, if spending, it was $500,000 or more, they would be able to get automatic or I don't know if it's automatic citizenship, but uh, a very sort of fast paced road to getting citizenship here in Portugal that would allow you to travel the EU just as you would if you're a Portuguese citizen. So Portugal really makes it very, in, in terms of money wise and taxes and just how friendly they make it for foreigners to come over here. It was just sort of like a no brainer after we started peeling away all those things and looking at the differences between, you know, for example, Spain and Portugal, Portugal just oh, sort yes. of won out for us. What are some, like, how do you deal with medical? So like I've seen in some of your videos, you're talking about the medical situation in Portugal and how it's awesome. How do you deal with, so you get like insurance in Portugal and then when you go back to the States, what do you do? Because if you get oh, sick of the when States, we, then okay. you're screwed. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But not with our plan, actually. So our plan is how many, is oh, it? Yes, that's right. I, I forgot days? about that. <laughs> but I mean, because our idea is don't go back to the States and get sick because right. <laughs> you'll be in the poorhouse, right? <laughs> so, I, and I remember when we were setting this up because we knew we were going to be going back to, to the States often to visit and so I wanted to figure out kind of what the international implications or how our insurance would apply uh, abroad and we have this thing with our insurance is through uh, Alliance um, it's a Portuguese uh, it, actually they're a worldwide insurance company but we're with Alliance Portugal and they allow us to travel abroad um, in and our insurance applies for 60 days yeah I think I it's 60 days Six, 60 days so if we're if we're back in the US and we happen you know something happens then we can use this insurance uh, for 60 days if we if we have to stay there. Otherwise, they're going to try to bring us back here to Portugal and have have our health care here. Um, but our health insurance is amazing and it's completely affordable. So uh, we have a private health insurance, and it was it was a it was a requirement when we applied for the visa to have this insurance in place. Portugal has universal health care. So even if we didn't have this insurance, we could walk into any public hospital and get service. Um, but in order for expats not to be a burden on the, on the health system here, they require you to also have this, this private in insurance. And so with our private insurance, we've used it four or five times already, you know, um, and it's just been amazing. You, you walk in, the copay is-, is Next some, to nothing. Yes, next to nothing, like 12, 12 euro. Um, and uh, a year we pay about less than 2000 US dollars a year. We pay for this insurance. For a family of four. For a family of four. And it's, it, it's the top level of insurance. Cause you know, Americans are always really scared about insurance. So we were like, give us the gold package. And <laughs> it, it was so inexpensive. We we're like, wow. So. Yeah, I mean, it's been really great, too. And we've gone, you know, like our, our little one had a fever once. And so we had to set up a, a, a same day appointment because she had a fever for a couple of days. Even Sonoa, our oldest one, had has had dental work done. Uh, one time our, our daughter at school fell off one of those little rip sticks. It's like a skateboard. And she's like, oh, I think I broke my arm. And we're like, you probably didn't, but let's go check it out. And she did it. But I mean, those types of things, it's just like, we've had no problems whatsoever at the hospitals here. We've had no problem communicating. It's just been, it's, it's so great. And if you look up the medical treatment or the medical standard in Portugal is actually ranked higher than the United States. So it's ranked higher and it is significantly less money compared to the United States as well. Yeah, the health system in the US, it's just kind of a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Do you guys keep like a home base in the States? Um, so like for mailing and that kind of stuff or do you get everything forwarded over to Portugal? 
Yeah, we have we have a home base and you know our family is still in the state so that helps to make things a lot easier, you know, like we can Aman's dad is in Japan, but my mom is in California where we're from and Aman's brother is in Hawaii. So we still have that home base if we ever needed to like return immediately or if we need things sent to us, you know, my my daughters are talking to Nana, which is my mom and saying, "Can you send us these hot flaming Cheetos? Can you send us these <laughs> I mean, they have this really insane list of all these American foods that they miss. And so they just add it to the list. <laughs> I'm like, can you send us this? Can you send us that? So it's nice that we have those uh, connections <laughs> in the States <laughs> to really help us out when we need something that they, we're really they missing. They can't survive but... <laughs> without their hot flame and Cheetos. I bet when, and it's, this is so funny because they always miss the things that they can't have, you know, uh, because when we lived in the U.S., they never wanted any of that stuff. They wanted they wanted people to send them things from Japan or from Spain, That's and now right. they're here in Portugal, so they want people to send them things from from Japan or the U.S. It, it's really funny, but just with how the world is set up now, you can live anywhere in the world, and you can still stay connected with your friends and family. You can still have access to all of these things, but Portugal has everything that you need. Um, people reach out to us, and they'll they'll ask us very unique things about like, do they have certain foods because I have a special diet? And I, I just like to do exploration. So I'll go out and I'll say, oh yeah, I found all these vegan places. Um, right now I'm talking to someone, uh, their child has autism and I'm trying to find out more information on some of the services that are here mm -hmm. in Portugal because these are things that, that keep people from getting out of their comfort zone because they they think that maybe their country you know that's all that exists but the world is very big and portugal is one of those countries that it's a it, it's it's a well-developed country they have access to to some of to everything that you would that you'd ever need so just um you know one of the things that we like to do with our channel is just to share our experience here to hopefully bring down some of these fears that people have about getting out of their comfort zones, you know, get a passport, come to Portugal. You'll see that it's, it's really an amazing place. It's, it may be just like your hometown. I need to come and visit. I like <laughs> Portugal's been on my list. I'm like, we need to go. Um, so your girls just started a YouTube channel, which is really cool. How have you instilled some of your values in them? Well, I think, you know, it's an interesting thing because there's there's talking and then there's doing right so we talk to them all the time about money we think it's so important and and like i said i i didn't i didn't talk about money when i was a kid i didn't have that money background and for us it is so important for our girls to understand how their money can work for them to understand how to invest they're so young right now 11 13 they're understanding these concepts that people even even adults aren't looking into that people adults aren't aware of you know they just sort of go through their day-to-day -day thing and, and and they don't think about investing and so i think it's definitely talking to our girls but it's also just how we behave with our girls too and they see how we spend money they see how we invest money they see you know they see our youtube channel we they they understand the concepts that we're talking about on our youtube channel and they were so excited to start their youtube channel because we had one video of them well we had several when they were really really tiny <laughs> but now recently they had a video on our on our channel and people were like wow this is really cool that they can they can understand these topics and then they sort of went with that and they're like we want a youtube channel we want our own youtube channel we want to create it and so they're doing the same version they're like the ours is our rich journey and they're the our rich journey juniors and so they're doing like the kids perspective but it's really i think for people that are interested in talking to their kids about money or, or teaching their kids about money it's really understanding or having this open relationship when when it comes to talking about money even if you weren't raised like that because a lot of people aren't raised to talk about money it's like a taboo subject mm -hmm. so you sort of have to shift shift gears and learn how to begin talking about money but it's also begin understanding that you're demonstrating your relationship with money also when your kids are around and they're observing what you're doing with money 
Very cool. I just explained, my son is seven, so I explained to him what appreciating, depreciating assets are, and he was oh. teaching <laughs> teaching my mom what they were. So I'm going to have oh him check out goodness. your guys, are their YouTube channel. So he's going to love that. It's so fun. That is so great. Oh, he's going to love it. He's going <laughs> to love it. This last week's video was, was so funny, but we were, I was in the room when they were shooting this week's video, and they made me leave because I was just, I was laughing too hard. <laughs> They're like, you, you're messing up our video. I mean, I was like a kid watching them just it was it's amazing to see your kids do something like this and they're working with christina to edit the videos and everything like that christina does all of the editing you know, on, on our videos and she's she's just amazing at it and so she's been showing our daughters how to how to do the same and it's, it's just so amazing to watch them that's gonna be so fun as a parent to see that. So I have a few more questions. This is about entrepreneurship. I asked like our community and cause I was gonna, I told them we were, I was interviewing you and they're like, I wanna ask them about this and this. So entrepreneurs, they're struggling with budgeting when their income is variable every month. So how would you suggest that they invest with a budget that they can't really predict? Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing. So I think there's, there's I guess you gotta sort of separate it, right? So typically you have your expenses and there are discretionary expenses and then there's non-discretionary expenses. So generally month to month, it can be pretty much the same unless you have these like really big fees or really big expenses one time of year or something like that. And you can sort of break that out and sort of understand what it would look like if you put it on a month to month basis. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that of really starting with understanding what your expenses are and then Looking at if, if there's areas to cut, then cutting it down, but understanding your core expenses. And then, of course, there's going to be months where if it, you have a variable income coming in, there's going to be lower months and there's going to be higher months. And so my, I think the thing that I would really recommend is that when you have those higher months, it doesn't mean that you should be spending more, right? It's like you, you have these expenses and if you make... Uh, whatever you make in month A, then you make more in month B. You can you can adjust for your expenses if you didn't have enough in your income from the previous month in order to cover those expensive expenses, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But even when you have variable incomes and you're bringing in more on a particular month, you shouldn't exceed your expenses just because you make more. And the idea is sort of break that out, make sure you cover all of your expenses. And then on those months where you have those higher months, if you've covered all your expenses already, that's where you take that extra money and you make sure that you build your emergency fund first. But then with that money, then you're able to start investing in that. So it may not be the same amount every single month that you're investing, but if you project it over the year, you should know by the end of the year how much you're going to be investing over a year's period, for example. Yeah. I never really considered ourselves uh, entrepreneurs when we were on this on this journey because we had a nine to five. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that we, we did is that once we had um, our system in place, we had an emergency fund, we had our budget, we had all of our expenses locked down. Whenever we got an influx of cash, we would just dump that into you know, our investments. So I think what Christina said about just once you establish that baseline, anything that you have above that baseline, you're able to just invest. And if ever you start to deplete that, that baseline and you have to dip into your emergency fund, then you have to readjust. And so you have to refill you know, refill those buckets again. But one of the things that we did when, and it, and it really inspired us is that we set up one investment that was that all our side hustle money would go into. And to see that side hustle money grow, to see that investment grow, I felt like we side hustled even harder because it was like, we know that was money that we did not make it work. That was money that we made out of thin air and look at it grow. So I, I think with entrepreneurs, they're in a very unique situation because they can determine how their money grows. And once they set up a system, if they can incentivize that system, it will inspire them to be a better investor, be a better saver. And I mean, I think entrepreneurs can get to fire a lot faster than someone that has a nine to five. 
Yeah. I like what you said about like still living at the baseline, even if you have a, like a really high month, because if you have a high month, you might be tempted to like go out and buy something nice. Like let's go get a new car. Hey, um, exactly. but still live at that baseline and then just take that and invest. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. And I think yes. that's important. It's, it's almost like lifestyle creep, right? Is this when you yes. make more, just invest more, don't spend more. Definitely. So you mentioned the Boggles Heads Guide to Investing. Do you have any other books that you recommend? Well, I think the Boglehead is good. There's three of those. So I would recommend actually reading all three of them just because they're, they, you can finish them in a couple hours and they are great for beginner, beginner investors. And we read The Intelligent Investor. It's, it's much more dense. And I think if you read the Bogleheads first and then you read The Intelligent Investor, this uh, was Benjamin Graham wrote the book and he was Warren Buffett's mentor. Wow. So it's like this really incredible insight to investing from like this you know, investing genius. Yeah. And so I think that's a great book, but I would start off with the Boglehead books. And then if you're looking for like free resources also, you know, I mentioned Warren Buffett or his mentor, but Warren Buffett, his share, his shareholder letters are available online every single year since the seventies, I think it is. So you can find those. And, and it's just like this again, insight from a genius investor, right? What he thinks about every single year when the market's tanking, when the market's doing well, those are great reads and you can pull snippets from that. And it's the entire letter every single year is available online. I also mentioned the Trinity study that is also available online to really understand like how does the 4% rule work? What happens when you're changing withdrawal rates? So those are all good resources for people that are trying to learn to invest and, and learn more about the fire movement. So the market has gone kind of crazy with coronavirus and everything. And it's been like up and then huge dip and now up again. Do you ever time the market and do you have any predictions on what's to come over the next year? Well, I love, I love that you asked that because no, we, we never make any attempts to time the market because I think, you know, like Aman said, one of the things that helped us so much was really consistency and making sure that we invested every single month, regardless of how the market was behaving. Because I mean, my only prediction for the year, the next year is that it's going to continue to be volatile and that's not in, it, it's no news because that's how the market has behaved for since it was created. You know, it's always been volatile. So it's never always going to go up. It's never always going to go down. It's just going up and down and up and down in terms of how it's behaved historically. So one of the problems if people start trying to time the market and thinking, I need to get in now or I should sell now and then I'm going to get in later, is that you can miss great opportunities in the market by not being in the market. And there's studies that show if you miss just a couple critical days in the market, then that can really, really have a huge impact on your portfolio. So market timing is just impossible. I mean, it's, it's great when you're looking back and saying, oh, I should have invested there and there and there, but it's not possible to do it in the future and certainly not consistency, cons consistently. Because when you're on the FIRE journey, your investments are supposed to last you for a lifetime. And so you cannot continue to try and time the market and continuously be accurate in timing the market throughout your lifetime. So our goal is really just let our money work in the background and don't worry about how the, the market is behaving. If it goes down, then we have our emergency fund. We just actually on our YouTube channel, we started a new investment pot to show people this is what happens when you're investing. Whether it goes down or up, this is how your investments can still continue to grow. And so I think if people are the, the goal should really not be market timing, but really getting your money into the market. It's time, time in the market. Exactly. Time in the market. I like that. Do you suggest strictly index funds, ETFs, a mixture of individual stocks, all of the above? Like what would you suggest to have a diversified portfolio? Well, I think if you, if you want diversification, this is, this is such a tough question because the choices that people make with their investment, they're all relative, right? This is, this, this is a, I think it's a very personal decision, mm -hmm. um, but it's one that we get so much. And so one of the, the things that we say is if you're looking for the ultimate diversification, if you want to invest in the total stock market, 
then you're better off investing with an index fund. Mm -hmm. um, picking individual stocks, especially for a new investor, that is a recipe for stress and disaster. But if you look at the historical return of the market um, and you use that history to kind of predict where the market's gonna go, then you're, you're far better off just picking an, um, a low cost index fund and putting all of your money in, in something like that. The more you start to learn about the stock market and if you wanna evolve and go into other areas, um, then maybe you start to pick individual stocks. I still do not recommend people pick, picking individual stocks. I think that there are so many good choices of sector ETFs. If you wanna invest in Apple or Google or things like that, then invest in a sector ETF that tracks technology. Or if you wanna invest in consumer goods, if you wanna invest in, you know, um, JC Penny, or JC Penny is, is, a, is a good, example but if you want to you know invest in some of these companies that provide staples then invest in an etf you know that does that but we think by far that index fund investing and etf investing that is the most efficient way to invest in the stock market got it what does it mean to you guys to make an impact oh, well wow. i'll tell you you know that that's actually why we started our youtube channel really is that you know, when we were on this journey, like we said at the beginning, it's like, we didn't have those resources. We didn't have those mentors to say, you know, this is an index fund. Why would you do this? Or why would you, an index fund so easy? Invest in an index fund. We didn't have people telling us that, or, or not necessarily telling us, but really informing us about how how things work in the market and, and investments and things like that. And and we had a friend that, you know, we'd talk to our friends about like, this is how we're investing. This is what we're doing. We're on this movement to retire early. And then one friend was like, you guys should start a YouTube channel. And we're like, really? I don't know if people, you know, like if you've seen our earlier videos, you would see why we were hesitant because we're like, oh, hi, we're from, you know, it was just very, very <laughs> awkward and so cringeworthy. And, but, you know, we did it, taking action, we did it. But I think for us, we thought, well, maybe we can make an impact because if we would have had someone like us telling us about fire and telling us how it's done and telling us all these different concepts, you know, we could have fired even earlier. And so like just recently, Aman and I spoke at the virtually at this university for or this university program where they were having high school kids over the summer who have volunteered to participate in this program that teaches them about finances and money. And these kids are, they are from underserved populations. They're high school kids and they're taking time from their summer, weeks worth of time from their summer in order to learn about finances. And so we were able to talk to them and tell them, you know, this is how we did it. We did not have the resources that you guys had in high school. And so being able to connect with people, either you know in person or virtually how it is now but like sharing our story on youtube and being able to see the impact that we're having on people is is incredible for us it's yeah. we we're so thankful that we get to share our story and that people listen <laughs> yeah this is this is truly a gift i didn't think that this would be our impact on on the world it's it's I, but i think and i don't say that like oh i was gonna make an impact some other way but <laughs> I think everyone has this ability to be able to make an impression or an impact on someone. And we just happen to have this, this gift of having this, this platform that we humbly started in our, in our house at the kitchen table, just having a conversation with people about money. And then people started engaging with us. And then people started saying, I've, I've taken action. And now we just feel, we feel obligated to release our videos every week because we know that people are counting on the information to stay inspired. If we failed at fire, I think people would be heartbroken because they would think it doesn't work, but <laughs> right. No, but I think that one of the gifts that we have is just to be able to, to share our journey. And we get so many messages from people that say, I bought my first index fund. And when someone tells me that, it just blows my mind because I know the power of that action. And I just, all I can say to them is just keep it up because 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you will be thanking yourself 
by doing this. You've just changed the trajectory of your entire life. My parents never invested a single dollar in the stock market, but they did make an impact on me by raising me in a healthy, safe environment. And they gave me a lot of different tools. And so now we're doing the same in our own way and we're extending it with our YouTube channel. And so I think that I'm just, I, 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 we wake up every day we're like we're retired and we get to do this also. Yeah. This is amazing. Well, you guys have made an impact on me and our family because I knew about investing, but it was by going through your course that was just like, I have a plan now and I took action and now it's like, wow, we're actually doing this. And I see like, all right, eight to 10 years from now, this is what's going to be. So thank you guys. I adore Aww. you <laughs> so much. Where can we connect with you? Well, we have our YouTube channel, which is just you on YouTube. It's called Our Rich Journey. But then we also have our website, which is just www.ourrichjourney.com. And then we're also on Instagram. Yes. But on Instagram, it's just Rich Journey. Cool. Well, thank you guys for being on the show. I yeah. yes, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much us. for having us.